In a world of Raspberry Pi cases, one case rules them all. This is the Retroflag G Pi case, and although it's technically a case, that's not really the case. This is the first commercially available Raspberry Pi Game Boy. Hey, welcome back, it's Zach from How Chew. Last week we received a pre-release unit to review. Before making this video, I spent several days messing with the G Pi, taking it apart, understanding how it works, and I even ran an AMA on our Retro Pi, the Retro Pi subreddit, to figure out what people really thought was important. Simply put, the GPI brings retro video game emulation further into the mainstream, all while making it totally portable. Because the RetroFlag GPI is actually a Raspberry Pi case, it relies on the tiny $10 Raspberry Pi Zero or Zero W computer, which it cleverly houses in a removable cartridge. The rest of the electronics inside the GPI are nothing but a simple interface for the inputs, screen, power, and speaker. The emulation itself is handled by RetroPi, a software library that allows you to load and emulate games on the GPI. You can also run Recallbox as an alternative to RetroPi, however RetroPi is more popular and generally better supported so that's what I recommend. No soldering is required. The Raspberry Pi interfaces with the GPI using a pogo pin system that connects the Raspberry Pi's 40 pin GPIO or general purpose input output header. Audio, video, button presses and more are all transmitted via GPIO. Now the GPI is expected to be released between June 10th and June 15th of 2019 for a price of $69.99. I've left a link in the video description where you can buy it once it goes on sale, save that link and check back often as the first batch is expected to sell out immediately. In this review video, I'll cover the basics of the RetroFlag GPI and how it works. Then I'll provide an overall review of each core feature based on the information that I've gathered. If you prefer a text and photo based review, I've linked to one that I wrote in the video description. Now in a week or two I'll be releasing a full setup, configuration and usage video for the GPI, so be sure to subscribe now so that you don't miss it. The GPI allows you to play and emulate thousands of your favorite retro games all on the go. Let's dig in. For years, clever makers on the Pseudomod forums have been building their own portable video game emulation consoles by putting Raspberry Pis into original Game Boy shells. What started with a lot of parts and soldering evolved into all-in-one printed circuit boards such as the Kite Circuit Sword. Now while Kite's brilliant Circuit Sword PCB takes a lot of the pain out of building your own Game Boy Zero, still requires a substantial time investment a knowledge of hobby electronics and soldering, and access to certain tools. Now in the box you'll find the GPI itself, a power cable, and a reversible screwdriver. You'll also find some instructions for putting everything together. So there are a few things you'll need to buy in addition to the GPI itself. You'll need a Raspberry Pi Zero or Zero W computer. I recommend the W because it adds Bluetooth and Wi-Fi into the mix. You'll also need a micro SD card for storing ROMs and the overall operating system, and an adapter for inserting it into your computer. You'll also need three AA batteries, either rechargeable or disposable, though obviously I recommend rechargeable batteries. I'll cover power more in depth in a few minutes. The GPI features many of the features of the original Game Boy, including an internal speaker, DC barrel power jack, screen brightness wheel, volume wheel, headphone jack, and power switch. It also adds a few, like easy external SD card access. The unit features a DC barreled USB cable that will power the unit without batteries. You can connect this to any 5 volt power source, such as your computer's USB port, an AC adapter, or even a portable power bank. Now the Retro Flag GPI case is slightly smaller than the original Game Boy, but otherwise it's a faithful recreation. Conspicuously present on the face of the device are new X and Y buttons, allowing you to play additional games from the Super Nintendo era onward. On the back, two shoulder buttons further cement the number of games you'll be able to play. Gone are the days of waiting for the next street lamp to pass so that you could unpause and continue your game on a hellish green screen. The GPI features a full color IPS LCD display and a wider aspect ratio than the original Game Boy's. At 2.8 inches, it's also noticeably larger than the original screen, despite the handheld itself being smaller. Now again, the GPI screen resolution is 320 by 240. This is sufficient for playing retro games, which were designed for low resolution displays to begin with, but sometimes the menus can be a bit hard to navigate because the text gets a little bit chunky. As far as quality goes, RetroFlag got this right. Cheap plastic and mushy unresponsive buttons would be a deal breaker, but the D-pad responds nicely as do the other buttons, and the plastic seems to be the same plastic that was originally used. The color's even spot on. The GPI is powered using three AA batteries, providing a total of 4.5 volts. Now since the Raspberry Pi requires 5 volts to run, there must be some internal circuitry boosting this 4.5 volts to 5 volts. 
Now, when you, when you boost voltage like that, you decrease the total output amperage and thus the overall capacity of the batteries themselves. So after running some basic power benchmark tests, the GPI seems to consume an average of 350 milliamps at 5 volts. I ran this test using Raspberry Pi Zero W while playing Super Mario Kart on full brightness. So using some Amazon branded alkaline batteries, you can expect about two and a half hours of runtime. I recommend picking up some rechargeable batteries so that you can squeeze a bit more out of them in addition to saving money in the long term. Now sometimes as makers, we do things just to see if we can without thinking about what the real problem is. And I'm actually very excited to see people put a rechargeable battery inside of the GPI. The only thing is, it's almost good how it is. I mean, you can buy some Eneloop NIMH rechargeable batteries and you'll have a couple sets around and you can pop them in when you're on the go when the thing dies. Or you could cut into this and install a LiPo battery and some kind of safety chip. And honestly, I just don't know if that's the best route. Now, I've taken this thing completely apart and believe me when I say there's not a lot of room in here. If you live near an Ikea, you can actually pop in there and pick up the Lada batteries. Eneloops are generally known as the best NIMH batteries that you can buy, and apparently IKEA sells them for seven bucks for four of them, and it's the exact same battery. While you're there, be sure to pick up one of their $1 hot dogs, or I'll eat these batteries instead. The only difference when you're using something like an NIMH battery is that it's actually 1.2 volts. So when you multiply that by three, you get 3.6. So now that you have 3.6 volts, the GPI has to boost it up to five, so the overall capacity actually decreases. However, with a stored capacity of 2450 milliamp hours in each battery, you'll still end up with more than if you use a traditional disposable alkaline battery. As far as sound goes, the GPI features both an internal speaker and a headphone jack in the same location as the original. Of course, you could also output sound via Bluetooth directly from the Pi to your Bluetooth headphones or a speaker of your choice. Now, the speaker gets surprisingly loud and the sound quality is decent. There's a small amount of static present, but this can be fixed with some software tweaks, and overall it's not that noticeable. Now I spoke earlier about the safe shutdown button. So when you turn off the Raspberry Pi, you want to do it safely. Like if you had a desktop computer plugged into the wall, you wouldn't just rip the cord out of the wall every time you want to turn it off. What happens is anything that's processing at that moment, anything that's being written to memory, can get corrupted because it's only partially written, and it only takes a few times of improperly shutting down your Pi to totally corrupt the operating system, and then you have to reinstall everything. So since the Raspberry Pi doesn't actually feature a power button, usually you'd have to install one yourself and then you'd run, you'd have a script that would wait for you to push the button and then it would send the safe shutdown command. So Retroflag cleverly created their own shutdown scripts that you can pull from GitHub and then you can use the toggle button on the top to safely turn the unit on and off. Now someone on Reddit asked me what would happen if the batteries died, if the GPI would shut itself down. So I ran a test overnight with my webcam and it turns out that when the power gets low, the LED starts flashing and then it does initiate a safe shutdown, which is a really nice touch. Now overall, I've been very impressed with the GPI, especially for only $70. They probably could have charged closer to 100 and they would sell just as many. It's a little bit small for my hands, but so are the Game Boy Color and Pocket, so I'll let that one go. Overall, it's a very faithful recreation. I think it's very clever that you actually take the cartridges apart to put the Raspberry Pi in. And I'm really excited to see what the modding community comes up with. Now you can find a link to buy the GPI in the video description along with some other helpful resources. I hope you found this review useful. If you did or didn't, please leave a comment and let me know about it. Again, don't forget to subscribe. We have tons of GPI and other content coming up. Here's a little spoiler. If you enjoyed this video, maybe you'd enjoy some of our others. We make great projects all the time, from 3D printing to Raspberry Pis and more. And as always, thank you very much for watching.